Rattalonis. Rolling, Joe. Rattalonis Hardware and Garden Stores brings you Garage Logic Podcast number 1,280. 76 degrees was the high on this day in 1938, and it was eight below on this day for the second day in a row in 1965. Hail the flashlight, King! And now, from the mayor's office above the boathouse on the east shore of Spoon Lake, it's Garage Logic with Chris Reavers manning Technology Corner, Kenny Olson from the Krabby Coffee Shop, John Height in the newsroom, and of course, the rookie. Here is your flashlight king, fireworks commissioner, and the keeper of common sense, your mayor, Joe Sushi. I feel remiss that we haven't touched base with the lake detective on this absence of winter as we sit here uh, trying to sort out what the meteorologists tell us about what's coming. And I, I think a, uh, I think a conversation with the lake detective might be in order. He's at his headquarters mm-hmm. uh, awaiting or uh, waiting out the storm. Is that true? Lake detective? Aha. Yeah, kind of, you know, mother nature, she always evens things out. We start out warm, now we're going cold. It's confusing us, but I'll tell you who's, who's most confused, the fish. Are they really? <laughs> yes, right. There's northern pike are supposed to be spawning right now. It's cold. Now it was warm, then cold. Man, all these fish are going to uh, be spawning at different rates, and and they might they might not get up a real good spawn this year. Have you been on any cases lately or is this your slow season? We are just gearing up. We got our, <laughs> we got our boat patch all welded up. We had a few little leaks. Sure. We got our motors all are, are, are all tuned up. We'll probably be hitting it next week if the snow melts. And right now you're in the office uh, where your gun is in the drawer with a bottle of uh, Jameson and the long legged blonde is out front. Monitoring phone calls and visitors. Absolutely, that's the yes. With that time of the year right now, and uh, you're right. That long, long-legged blonde is um, is, is uh, screening things and keeping us in uh, in shape as well. How rough will this winter have been on the lakes? You know, um, it's going to affect some species, but generally, what's going to happen is. By midsummer, we're going to be almost back to normal. Mm-hmm. Now we have low lake levels. The probably the biggest thing this winter was lack of snow, so we didn't have very much runoff. We're not getting very many nutrients coming into our lake. They're probably going to be relatively clear this year, right? Or this summer. But that's but a good thing, happens, isn't that a good thing? That is a good thing, except with the increased clarity and you know pretty water, sunlight will increase. Uh, its penetration depth, and probably start uh, uh, bringing up some native aquatic plants. So it might be a big bumper year, bumper crop for native aquatic plants. I had an emailer who was curious about mercury levels in Minnesota lakes. Is that a big problem in Minnesota? Not, you know, actually mercury levels are starting to decrease Mm -hmm. in our lakes. They're still there. It just doesn't go away. Eventually it'll be buried. But since we've stopped uh, the steel mill, believe it or not, steel mills down Gary, Indiana, were a big source of mercury, of atmospheric mercury, which then drifted over with long-range transport and fell both dry fall and wet fall coming into our lakes. Almost all the lakes have some mercury in them. The problem is fish will, uh, as they're eating, the, is eating their forage and everything else, that mercury is kind of going through the food chain to a degree. But... Only the biggest fish would have any type of an advisory, and even then, it's like one meal a week, which typically uh, we're not doing. We're not eating more than one meal of walleyes a week. No, we go to Tavern on Grand. <laughs> right, and they're closing anyway. That's right. So we better hurry up. Right. Uh, you know, we didn't touch base with you, but earlier in the winter, we had the story of a decimated deer on White Bear Lake. It looked like it was really, uh, really ravaged apart. And we were wondering if it could have been wolves, but I think what we did is settle on coyotes. Does that make sense? Yes, coyotes, and then if it's down for any length of time, maybe even some fox coming by to uh, to grab a bite or so. But uh, it's it's rough. It's a dog eat dog world out there. It is. 
we're going to, we're going to lose a few deer and other, other critters over, over the course of the winter and even the summer. But I tell you, urban wildlife is, um, is coming back, uh, and it's coming back pretty strong. Now, earlier in this conversation, you said everything's going to be back to normal by mid summer. What are you basing that on? Mother nature just kind of evens things out. What's happening is a few species like curly leaf pondweed right now is uh, going to have a real benefit and real advantage based on the light snowfall and early ice out. But the native plants, they don't really respond to these environmental cues until June anyway. And by June, our temperatures will probably be close, close to normal and it will be kind of a regular type year. What's going to happen, probably maybe the biggest impact will be on fish and possibly their fish spawning and the timing. If walleyes are spawning too early, they hatch out and the fry, the young fish, don't have quite the food source they would typically have if they were spawning even uh, two to three weeks later in the uh, spring. Okay. So sometimes, that, as they say, timing is everything. Right. Well, I'm glad to know your skiff is ready. The skiff is named Good Luck. You That's are right. uh, you are about to take on cases. You are the lake detective, and it's always heartening to talk to you on a positive Thursday. I think this is all on a positive note. Mm-hmm. We got a lot of good things happening uh, in the lake this year. Are, they're they're, they're going to be starting. They'll be starting out low, but uh, they're going to be in in dang good shape by midsummer. Wonderful, Steve McComas of Blue Water Science. You are the lake detective. You've never been <laughs> stumped, and I thank you for checking in. Well, thank you very much, and I'll be I'll be ready for anything. Uh, keep me posted. We will. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Yeah. Lake Detective. Never been stuck. Isn't that great news? Yeah. Uh, in fact, here's an email. I'm hoping you'll be able to tell listeners in advance when the late detective might be here. Well, he was just here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Whoops. And, Make sure uh, to listen. Yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to say that uh, we had the uh, the youth climate change coordinator for the UN is the young Pakistani American who believes white people are the cause of climate change, and she she singled out the white corporate leaders of uh, oil companies, for example. Huh. We could only get rid of them. Everything would be perfect. They're at fault, okay. And I got a note from Chris who writes, I can't figure out how to spell that young woman's name from the UN, uh, but her statements regarding white men and fossil fuels is entirely false. The top five oil companies in the world ranked by market cap are presided over by the following. Number one is Saudi Aramco. The president is Arim Nassar, a Saudi Arabian man. Two is ExxonMobil, President Darren Woods, a white American man. Number three is Chevron. The president is Mike Wirth, a a white American man. Number four is PetroChina. The president is Duan Liangui, a Chinese man. Shell is number five. The president is Gretchen Watkins, a white American woman. In sum, two of the top five oil companies in the world are run by white men. To say this is white men's doing is categorically false. Well, of course it is. Hmm. Of course, they don't fact check themselves. No, and they don't understand their own irony. You don't know how precious the movement's gotten, though? Give me some preciousness. I'm going to give you some preciousness. The uh, people running the Paris Summer Olympics, I'm sure they'll excuse themselves in their executive suites, but they're not going to allow any air conditioning. <laughs> oh, yeah, because uh, that would be hurting the earth. And they say they've designed buildings so that they would be comfortable to live in in the summer. We don't need air conditioning because we've oriented the facade so that they wouldn't get too much sun during the summer. And the facades uh, and the insulation is efficient, said Jan Krasinski, who was directing the service of infrastructure for the games. Now, he'll retire to an air-conditioned office right. every afternoon. I'm sure of it. But the athletes will be uh, sleeping in. Uh, I bet that'll smell really in, nice. Too. In the uh, Stalag wood cabins, it sounds Gross. like. And they'll be nice and warm. But uh, And once the games are over, uh, the buildings... Uh, to use uh, to house athletes will become housing for up to 6,000 Parisians. 
Uh, the Ooh. attempt to make carbon footprint history does not come without risks. Some three, th some 5,000 people died in France last year due to oppressive heat, and forecasters have claimed there is a possibility of similarly sweltering conditions this summer as well, but that won't be true of the Summer Olympics because they're going to be a climate change hysteria free zone. So they won't have any heat there. Got it. It'll be I've seen right. words, uh, words like scorcher being used yeah. for uh, this yeah. summer's predictions. And doesn't Paris already smell like dirty underpants anyway? Yes, yeah, yes. I I'm sure this will be lovely. Yeah. I had uh, deep thoughts on the service road of life. Let's go, bro. This is your forum. Well, half the country uh, apparently thinks everything's fine. Everything's pretty normal, right? And the other half, there's a vibe in your head that's saying things aren't right. Things, things are off a little. Okay. And I began to list them in my mind. Now, maybe it makes a difference that I live in the sustainable urban core. Maybe you, uh, you distant staff members don't, don't sense a lot of this. For example, quite a few streetlights are out. Uh, in and of itself, that's something we can survive. But as you drive along, there's a street light that's on, and then the next one you can see the violated cover at the base of the street light and the protruding wires. Gas prices are high. Food prices are high. Uh, last night, the uh, local news had a segment, happy, a happy segment about dogs with with security uh, forces patrolling the Mall of America. Okay. The well, footage I saw, the dog was sniffing a gal's butt I know, she as went she walked the, along. He, he, the dog went after her butt twice. <laughs> it's just... Can't blame wow. him. And wow. I, thought, I thought, okay, uh, that's the times we live in. But it wasn't that long ago that that wasn't the time we lived in. When the CP first started haunting the Mall of America, there were no dogs ready to take a bite out of it. I see what you're saying. So you got dogs, and you got streetlights, and you got grocery prices. But and you wouldn't got that correlate prices. with the decline of civility? Yes. And then you've got, uh, not on all streets, but if you go up and down University Avenue, you can see quite a bit of trash. Mm -hmm. And we've come to understand that the, the light rail is essentially use at your own risk. Uh, which I don't think is hyperbole. Mm -mm. Uh, so there's these vibes we have that that tell us, those of us who are on the side of something isn't right, that something isn't right. And then I compounded the deep thought by wondering about Mary Moriarty. Uh, we have the lead story in the in the uh, Star Tribune today. Another story on. Uh, the idea that Londergren was acting precisely as he was taught to act. Uh, for Use of force experts are acknowledging that he did not uh, misbehave or he did not disregard his training. The forces, the patrol's own uh, trooper in charge of such things says he followed protocol. And it seems what's happened now is there's a little bit of a bickering war between the defense and Moriarty's office and the governor typically struggling to discover where he should be on this is weighing in. And I heard a, a former uh, Judge Kevin Burke on the news last night saying that was a mistake on the governor's part. Which part? The uh, weighing in on this. Okay. Uh, Initially or most, most recently? Most recently. Okay. And the mistake would be that he's not allowing the justice system to proceed uh, with its own uh, form, and he's he's weighing in. But I think what's happened is, even even Walls has recognized why why is the county attorney disregarding the testimony of the very experts she hired, and then you have Moriarty fighting back, saying you're uh, you're taking sentences and words out of this guy's findings out of context. Well, it's a 37-page report. 
And as Burke noted, the defense can't introduce the whole 37 pages at trial. So they took sentences that say Londrigan was following his protocol. Mm -hmm. And Moriarty wants to acknowledge, wants to insist that that's taken out of pro uh, of context. And it, it, it doesn't seem that it has been. The context is that he was following protocol. Now, Here's where I have my deep thought about Moriarty. Is she part, and I don't know the answer, I'm willing to be educated. Is she part of a movement in the country that is dedicated to ruining the culture of law enforcement? Uh, or, yes. or, well, no, don't be so hasty. Or is she merely driven by her ideological belief that uh, oppressed people must be rescued by the likes of her uh, and that a uh, byproduct of her rescuing the oppressed would necessarily follow as an attack on law enforcement with no overriding attempt to undo uh, uh, the American culture of there being right and wrong and having law enforcement. Have I drawn a deep enough divide in my deep thinking? In other words, is Mary Moriarty a truly bad person or is she just a woman dedicated to her beliefs that for all I know, she might have come by theologically? Both. Both. Mm -hmm. Both. A and B. Can, one it, and two, be, can it be both? Yeah. 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 Um, number one as a result of number two. Yeah. Yeah. I yes. Know. Her but, right, insane it, ideals have led to number one. And but she's there, not hiding behind anything. Remember, she campaigned on this very thing. But the reason uh, to ask about her is that she is not behaving that differently from attorneys in other cities the closer you get to the country's tallest buildings. Right. That's are, right they, are they acting in concert Yes. to specifically speed up the demolition of the country? Are you asking, have they had a, held a secret meeting and this is what they've decided? I can't come to that point, but you, you do wonder, is there a wizard somewhere? Seems yes. like it. In yeah. it, the wizard happens to be the person funding all of these candidates. Well, They're looking for well, an agenda. Yeah. And, and now that new rich gal, uh, the divorced rich gal, who's throwing her money against um, behind Democratic stuff. Right. I don't know that she's... Uh, the Amazon gal? Yeah. She is. No, I she don't is. know that she's weighed in on county and district attorneys. No, but Bill Glahn had a piece this yeah. morning. Well, I'm going to get to Bill Glahn in a moment. Sorry. He had a good piece in the American Experiment. But that's the deep thought I have. Are we witnessing an intended destruction of the country. Because I submit to you, if you let criminals go and do not require them to suffer consequences, you are, you are speeding up the destruction of the country. You are condoning anarchy. Mm -hmm. You are condoning a complete disruption of the culture of right and wrong. And you would be hastening the development of, of a country that has nothing to do with our constitution. It would probably in fact, draw up some facsimile of what they might call a new constitution. And it would not be the United States that, you know, and, and why half the country can't see that is a puzzle to me. And, and the half the, and the a great portion of the country does see that and a great middle ground is wrestling with it. But Joe, the, the, the 50 percent of the country that might have a differing opinion would blame those mistakes on something else. Let me ask We've you seen something. it all the time. <clears throat> it, along those lines, along th that vein, you said in the beginning, it might be different out in the outskirts. And it definitely is out here. Um, tell me why. Why? Why you couldn't get away with that crap in Douglas County, Otter Tail County, you know, anywhere, uh, St. Louis County. You can't get away with that as in the outskirts that you can get away with in the metro area. Why is that? I guess my simple answer would be that, and it's happening. We've seen it happen. 
But my simple answer would be the more, uh, the more in the, the farther away you get from the country's tallest buildings, you have yet to attract uh, the people living there who are professional activists as a calling. Mm. Interlopers, the they, people. Yes, you're absolutely right. And that's what I, I, I'm glad you made that point. The people who are the county attorney or the public defender, the sheriff, the cops, all the deputies, police officers, they all have to deal with us every day because they come from us. They're not interlopers. They don't come from a movement somewhere. We n Not only do we know them, we know their parents and their grandparents, and we're not going to put up with their shit, and we're going to get right in their face. And they know that. Well, plus and they I think lived that's why and it's, worked there. Right, absolutely. And I think that's why you don't see it as much in the outskirts. But that's, you've begun to see it as close as St. Cloud, where we uh, followed without a Without a doubt. Uh, who uh, wanted to uh, address all sorts of... Right, uh, that little community right next to St. Was it St. Rapids? St. Joseph's. Something like that, yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, you're far enough away that that hasn't happened yet. You're yeah, far yeah. enough away that there is no money for a professional activist to make by going to wherever you live and campaigning for a city council seat. Right. We know each other by first name. Right. Yeah. And we're going to see you at the convenience store at Fleet Farm or wherever. Right. <clears throat> we're here, that, which is, I'm glad you met, made that mention. It's what something that's been in my craw for years. We're here in the urban core. Uh, citizens never run into these, at least the citizens I know, they Same never point. run into school supers. Yeah. They never run into city council members. The mayor is occasionally seen, but not often. Uh, they travel in their own circle. And they're surrounded by their own circle. Mm -hmm. That can't be true where Kenny lives. It's not true where I live. And that's not true where you live. And it's only somewhat less true where you live, South mm -hmm. St. Paul. Yeah. Joe, uh, two which days has ago. A, which has one of the finest mayors that any citizen could ask for. We should move to St. Paul. A guy named Jim Francis, who was a GLer, been with our show for ages. Two uh, two days ago, you called me, and I was in a meeting with the mayor. Uh, the mayor was showing me how to tune a Makuni carburetor. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's his job, turning wrenches on motorbikes and snowmobiles. <laughs> Isn't that something? Yeah, yeah. Isn't that something? Can you see Fry or Carter? <laughs> no. They don't know what a carburetor no. is. No, no. <laughs> Seriously, they don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know if you'd have this trouble in Sioux Falls. Uh, for the time being, you certainly don't. If you're thinking about moving out of Minnesota, as I've said, I'll miss you, but I can't blame you for taking a long, hard look at Sioux.